There, there are two letters to the same church, letters by the Apostle Paul. This is not really the main message, but introduction to it. And uh, he writes to the church called the Church at Thessalonica. And the church is going through a bit, you know, some real struggles because there's a lot of persecution. And so they have a little bit of a, an escape mentality. In other words, they want out. I mean, enough of suffering already. We've had so much of suffering. They want out. So the teaching, uh, they thought more on the second coming of Jesus. Oh, he's going to come, then he's going to take us all away. Wow, wouldn't that be wonderful? So in their teaching, they also began to teach that since Christ is coming, uh, why, do we, why do we want to work? <laughs> so that's why Paul wrote to the church and says, if a man does not work, he should not eat. You know, so they, that, that was their whole concept, the whole teaching. In fact, it has come into the world right now where people are saying, you know, if Christ is going to come and we believe he's going to come in this year, this year, therefore let's go take uh, big loans, buy big houses. I mean, take big bank loans so that uh, uh, when Christ comes, we don't have to pay anyway. Talk about Christian responsibility. That's terrible, isn't it? Uh, now, in writing to that church, he also wrote this. Everybody say First Thessalonians. Chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. That's, that's not my text, but I just want you to memorize the word this morning. Can we do that? Oy. Today, you're going to be proud that you can memorize Scripture. Okay? Let's go. Say 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 16. Very difficult verse to memorize. Say it after me now. Rejoice evermore. Oh, give your hand, yourself a good hand. You memorize the scripture. Isn't that powerful? Come on. You just memorize the scripture. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Rejoice evermore. Come on. Wow, you memorize scripture, man. Verse 17. Huh? No. Pray without ceasing. Come on. First Thessalonians. No, no, no. Say, say the scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Wow, you memorize the second scripture. Isn't that powerful? First scripture, only two words. Second scripture, three words. Third scripture, verse 18. Right? What does it say? In everything, give thanks. Come on, everybody say. In everything, give thanks. Four words. So the first one, two words. Second one, three words. Fourth one, four words. Pray without ceasing. Verse 18, in everything give thanks. So these three things, he concludes in verse 18. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So if you want to know the will of God, very simple. Number one, rejoice Oy. for God. Rejoice Evermore, second thing, pray without ceasing. Third thing, man, you guys are so brilliant. You memorize three scriptures. Why do you say you cannot memorize the word? Can memorize, very easy. Come on, amen. So in between rejoice evermore and in everything give thanks, there is sandwiched between these two verses, the little scripture that says pray without ceasing. Pastor David, why do you keep talking about prayer on different times? Because that's what Paul says. The word pray without ceasing simply means live your life prayerfully. Does not mean you got to keep on speaking in tongues and you're driving, close your eyes and pray in tongues. And you know what I'm saying? It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that you got to be praying all the time, but live your life prayerfully before the Lord. Come on. Amen. That's why we are talking about prayer. So this morning, we want to go to uh, the uh, Gospel of Mark. Last week, Pastor Stefan used the scripture. I'm not going to go into the whole chapter. But again, chapter 9, Mark's Gospel, verse 24. Another prayer that we ought to pray, okay? You know the story. Pastor Stefan already preached on it. He talked about uh, the Father. How do, you, how do you, you know, wait for your breakthrough? Isn't that what he said? Yes? You all remember last week's message? How do you wait for your breakthrough? Now, no, this is about uh, uh, the Father, and this is what it says. No sooner were the words out of Jesus' mouth that the Father cried out, Then I believe, help me 
overcome my doubts. That's the prayer we ought to pray. Help me, the, the, of course, uh, other translation says, help my unbelief. Or the word is not unbelief because unbelief is sin. The word there is, help me to overcome my doubts. Help me to overcome my doubts. Now, we live in, in a, you know, we are going to go into John, uh, John's Gospel, chapter 11, actually. That's where our whole text is going to be this morning. I'm not going to give you points. I'm just going to give you scriptures. But we live by what uh, we call very, very natural laws, right? We follow very natural laws. We call it the law of gravity. We talk about uh, uh, oxygen. And we talk about carbon dioxide. We know all these laws in operation, how the sun rises, how the sun sets, how the sun travels around the earth at 107,000 kilometers per hour. The uh, moon goes around. All these things are called natural laws. And because there are natural laws... Science is possible because there are natural laws functioning, okay? By using those laws, uh, science is possible. But as believers, we live, we want to live in a realm of the supernatural. The supernatural is where God crosses the line, where God uh, kind of overlooks or overrides the laws that he has already set in motion. And he does this because... Uh, uh, there is a need to do so. He overrides these laws for a specific reason, for a specific purpose, and at a specific time. We call that a miracle. We call it a miracle. Now, the day that I said, I, I approach God by faith, believing that there is a God, for he who comes to God must believe that God is. So I came to God one day, and I said, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Please forgive me of all my sins. I believe that you love me so much that you gave me Jesus, your son, to die on the cross. Take all my sin upon him that I might take his righteousness. I believe that he also rose again from the dead. And that he is now at the right hand of the Father and that he lives forevermore. The moment I began to pray that prayer in faith, I have been translated into the kingdom of his son. And now I, am, I have full access into the supernatural. Come on, amen. All right? That's what happened. As believers, we now have access into the supernatural realm of God. The realm of miracles. Where God operates. Come on. Come on, you don't seem to be excited. We are no longer bound by natural laws. Unfortunately, we have become so uh, accustomed to uh, the natural that we miss, uh, we resist, we deny, we reject the supernatural. Because we are so used to, or we, we live in, such, uh, in the natural world for so long that we cannot think outside of the box. And that is what God wants us to do. That's the problem that we have. So now we go into John's Gospel, chapter 11. Let me give you a little bit of the background behind this. You, we all know the story. John chapter 11 is a whole chapter dedicated to what? Come on. Huh? <gasps> You're not reading your Bibles. To the raising of Lazarus from the dead. The entire chapter of John 11 has to do with absolute supernatural deed of God. The raising of Lazarus from the dead. So now, they come to Jesus and they say, Lord, him whom you love, that's, that's the approach. Him whom you love is sick. Now, sometimes church, I, I want, I, this is maybe a little bit out, but I, I get good morning messages and scriptures that are quoted, like it is God's desire to prosper you and to bless you. I'm sure many of you have got scriptures like this, which is wonderful, very encouraging. The sad part about it is, I asked my wife the other day, you know, and she gave me the right answer, but here's a scripture, uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. How many of you know that one? For I know the plans that I have for you, plans to, plans to prosper you, to give you a future, to give you a hope. So when you look at that scripture, it is very easy to get caught up with 
the plans to prosper me, the plans for my future, the plans for my hope, and miss out God. So we focus on the prosperity, on the blessing, and we forget to understand that God is the one who's going to do it. And he's left out of the picture. So we're waiting for the promises to be fulfilled without wanting the promiser. Blessing without the blesser. But if you know him, and he's the one that you seek first, then all these things shall be added unto you. So the approach was, Lord, we know that you love him, and so therefore you will hear and answer our prayer. And they bring the request before him, and Jesus begins to delay. Now chapter 11, do I have this? And verse 21. Now when Jesus comes to the scene, Martha is the one who comes out first to meet him. And this is what she says. Lord, if you had only come sooner, my brother would not have died. Then he goes into the home. Mary, of course, is the quiet one who will sit down and cry first and then talk later. So she's in the house and she's crying. And she says the same thing. If you had only come a little earlier, my brother would not have died. Now notice earlier it was him whom you love, now it is my brother. Have you noticed a change? Earlier it was his responsibility, now it is now our, our thing. Now try to understand this. Jesus had made a statement. Listen very carefully. He had made a statement. The statement was this. This sickness is not unto death. Okay. That's what he said. So here are the sisters completely frustrated because he said, Lazarus is not going to die. That's what he said. He said that Lazarus would recover. That's what we read into what he has said. That's where we fall into danger. Where we begin to read into things that the Lord has not actually said. He said, this sickness is not unto death, did not mean that he's not going to die, but he's not going to remain a dead situation. Something good's going to happen. Come on, amen? All right? Now, he said, sometimes we get a promise from God, and then we say, but God said so. And we don't really quote it in the way it was said. That's why the Bible says this. The word that proceeds out of my mouth, it shall prosper. Not the word that proceeds, out, the word that I gave you that proceeds out of your mouth shall prosper. But the word that proceeds out of my mouth shall prosper. And you, faith comes by hearing and hearing by that word that comes out of his mouth. Come on, amen. When there is a correct interpretation of the word of God, then faith begins to get built into our lives. Sometimes we take scriptures and then we make it say what we would like it to say. This is not unto death. Well, he did say, and so you can picture these two frustrated uh, sisters uh, uh, now beginning to get very, very upset. And so when Jesus comes back, they kind of like get, you know, vent out their, their feelings. If you had only come, you know what? If the truth be told, sometimes we can blame God for situations that we are in. You said something and then you don't fulfill it. He whom you love, now it is my brother. Uh, sometimes we can blame the Lord for being negligent in carrying out his responsibility. You said that you, he, this would not happen. You, you told us. And so if only you had told us he was going to die, at least we could have taken him to the doctor or do something about it. But we believed your word. You said it, he was not going to die. And so sometimes we can kind of blame God when things don't work out exactly the way we thought it would work out. All right, let's continue with this one. Verse 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 35, verse 38. Jesus wept. Then Jesus, verse 38, moved with intense emotion, came to the tomb. He is moved, he's weeping, not because, you know, he's, he's sorry for Lazarus because he knows what he's about to do. Okay? He's weeping because of the, the atmosphere of total unbelief right now. He is there, but nobody 
expects anything to happen. Uh, he has spoken, but his words seem to have fallen flat on the ground. He's trying to impress them with his whole being that he is the resurrection and he is the life. He is there. I am the resurrection. I am the life. But he is moved by their, not just lack of faith, by the whole situation that's there. There's such a lot of, of, of uh, frustration. There's a, such a lot of disappointment. And I want us to understand that God can be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. Come on, amen. He knows what we are feeling. He, he, he weeps together with us. He's weeping because uh, uh, he's not seeing what he desires to see. He's weeping because he's, they have heard him so many times, but nothing seems to be registering. Uh, there's a lot of things that's going on. Jesus begins to weep. Hebrews 4.15 talks about how uh, uh, he can be touched by the feelings of, of our emotions. But listen to this one. Although he's very emotional about the whole situation. Jesus does not allow his emotions to dictate his theology. He does not allow what he is feeling to overrule what God is about to do or what God has spoken to him. Are you following with me? Sometimes our feelings can get in the way. What God says and what our feelings tell us. Come on, amen? Some of us prefer friendships above righteousness. When we know that something is wrong, we do not come out and speak the truth. Why? Because our emotions are involved in the whole situation. So we dare not say things in order to, because we might hurt somebody. Jesus was full of grace, but he was also full of truth. Amen? So there needs to be a balance of, of two. So Jesus comes now, and, and uh, here's what's, what he begins to say. Verse 39. He commands them, roll away the stone. Roll away the stone. Now, faith is not a feeling. We sing, you know, I believe, I believe, and all of that. That's wonderful. You can keep singing, I believe, I believe, I believe, and nothing will happen. I believe. I ask them to sing that song because I want us to say, God, I really believe your word. Come on, Amen. But you can keep saying it. They can stand at the, at the entrance of the tomb with a big boulder right across it. And they can keep shouting, I believe, I believe there's a miracle there. God, something is going to happen. But unless and until they move the stone, nothing's going to happen. So faith is actually acting upon what God has said. Come on, amen. James tells us, it, faith without works is dead. Now we know that. So when God gives a word, that command must be carried out, whether it makes sense or it does not make sense, right? So faith is exercising or acting upon what the Lord has told us. Verse uh, 39, Martha interrupts, and I remember Martha is the talking one, but Lord, it's been four days, verse, all right, it has been four days, and by this time, the body is already decomposing and he is stinking. All right. So she interrupts what the Lord is saying. He's telling her, you know, remove the stone. He's about to perform a miracle. He's about to take them from the natural into the supernatural. But the natural will always invade the supernatural. Logic will always stop what God actually wants to do. So she says something that all of us often do. When God says, do something, we go, but Jesus. You do not understand the situation. How many of us have given information to the Lord that we think he does not know about? Like, uh, in case you don't know, the man has been dead. This is not the 21st century kind of thing. We don't have the kind of embalming that they have in the 21st century. By now, he is decomposing. There's a lot of heat inside that little cave. We are living in the Middle East. It's hot. The cave is hot. His body has started to decompose. It's already four days. He is decomposing and the whole tomb stinks. In case you don't know. All right? Now, the Lord is about to do something, but we give him information that we think he does not understand. We begin to say things like Mary does, like Martha does. Now, in the same way, we can also have our but lords when it comes to different areas that God is speaking to us about. All right? Like, for example, Jonathan talked about uh, sacrificial giving. We go, 
Is that, does that really work? We talk about tithing. Do you know that if everybody in the church tithes, we don't have to take mission offering? We'll have more than enough. Why? Because we've already paid off our buildings. We can now help to build other churches. Come on, amen? From day one, you know, when we began to pioneer the church, I always said to our little committee that we had when we started going on, I said, the church must not have a big bank account. It is sinful. When money comes in, we must use it. Not for ice cream. Lah. I'm talking about we should use it to invest in other churches. Bill works. Reach out in missions. I don't want the Lord to come back and say, I gave you the money, why did you bury it and put it in the bank? Come on, amen. You don't like me. If I am the pastor, there will be very little money in the bank. Amen. Hallelujah. But there will be mission works that we start, mission works that we support. Come on, amen. So when we talk about giving you, your mind immediately goes into the, the logical area. I mean, how does this work? It doesn't work. Now, in order to cross from the natural into the supernatural, one step, you've got to believe and act upon what God has asked you to do. When you do that, things begin to happen. I was sharing last uh, Sunday afternoon with the Bahasa section, and I said, listen, man, this scripture actually works. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you... Come on. You really believe that? Do you think that's just a nice thing to put in your, you know, send out to people? Delight? It is an actual scripture. God's giving a promise that if we delight ourselves in the Lord. And I began to share with them from day one how I became a Christian and how I delighted myself in the Lord and how God gave me the most beautiful woman in the church and... Uh, I mean, it just went on and how God provided for our needs and how our children and how the houses and, and et cetera, et cetera. And how now I write a holly. It says here, I'm a biker granddad. At the back of the t-shirt, it says, 10 grandkids and counting. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, he, he gives you the desires of your heart. So, the command to me is, David, learn to delight yourself in me. Simple. Amen? Learn to delight yourself in me. I will give you not just what you need. I will give you the desires of your heart. I will. This is a promise. So, when he says, remove the stone, logic can come in. And then we begin. To, and logic is the number one thing. I, I, I want to hit on that one because the human logic uh, that we have. We have educated ourselves out of the miracles. We have become too educated for our own good. That's the problem. Now, whatever she said was absolutely true. When we tell him, you don't understand, I don't have enough finances to make it through the month, and then the preacher man gets up there, quotes from your word and says, you must die. How am I going to give 10% when I don't even have enough to pay the bills? And yet he says, if you do that, I promise you, I will bless you to the place where you won't have enough to even receive. So who am I going to believe? Am I going to believe the natural, logical thinking of what I have right now? Or am I going to believe God? Come on. Harden it. Move the stone. But by now, you don't understand. But Lord. No wonder they say, this is how you identify goat and sheep in the church. Goats will always butt. But, but, but. Sheep will always go, amen. Amen. <laughs> That's how you identify. But Lord, but Lord. We educate ourselves out of the supernatural. We live in the, the uh, realm of the logical too long that we stay in the, in the natural and cannot cross over to the other side. And God desires His church to be one where the gates of hell will not prevail. Where nothing can stop us from entering. We access heaven. We talk about, why do you think God tells us to pray prayers like, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth? Why? Why would you teach us a prayer that all of the kingdom and the kingdom's wealth and the kingdom blessing, uh, you know, upon my family, upon my children, peace, prosperity, all these things, free of sickness and everything else, 
Why would you tell us to pray that that come on earth? That's why I say sometimes people use the wrong scripture and quote it wrongly. For example, I heard a preacher once pray. This is a big conference and he's preaching. And his whole message was, when we get to heaven, there will be no more crying, which means that on earth you cry. When we get to heaven, there will be no more pain. That means on earth you will have pain. Now, guess what? God always confirms his word with signs following. You preach pain, guess what's going to happen to the people? Pain. You preach suffering, guess what's going to happen? Pastor David, do you believe in prosperity? No, my question to you is, do you believe in poverty? Come on. Why you preach on prosperity? Why you preach on blessing? Well, do you believe that we should be cursed? Will I, will I go the way of preaching cursing on people? No, I will preach prosperity. I will preach blessing, but I also will help you to understand that when you follow the laws of God, if you obey Him, everything comes down to one word, obey. Do not partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and, a and evil. Obey me on that one. No, they disobeyed, man, and so sin came into the world. If they had obeyed, brothers and sisters, we'd be living so well. No sin upon the earth. Come on. Amen? No sin. Just one thing that they did. They disobeyed. So, <clears throat> let me just go on very quickly now. Uh, verse, uh, the next one. She interrupts verse 40. Jesus looked at her. Jesus looked at her. <clears throat> and he said, didn't I tell you? Jesus looked at her. Huh? There's something powerful when Christ, when it puts it there in the word, it means there was something special. Jesus looking at the rich young ruler loved him. But he let the guy go away because the guy wasn't willing to obey him. Let him go away. Looking at him. Huh? There's such a lot. I can see the love in your eyes. Isn't that what we say? There is such compassion. Tuesday, you know, I was singing that, that love song that came out years and years ago. The look of love is in your eyes. That look, some of you are going, which century is this? Your smile cannot Disguise the look of love. All right. You can tell I was born just before First World War. <clears throat> the look of love. Looking at her said, didn't I tell you? Have you not been paying attention to what I have been saying, Martha? Have you not been hearing what I am trying to say? You know, we can hear and yet not hear. Why do you think Jesus writes to all the seven churches and says the same thing at the end of each letter? Let him who has an ear to hear, hear. But I'm hearing. No, you're not hearing. If you, if you can only hear what I am saying. Martha, have you not heard what I have just said? I am the resurrection. I am the life. If you, verse 40, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Natural, seeing is believing. Supernatural, believing is seeing. But we live in the natural. So if I see first, it's sad, you know, because some people, when we started to put up the building and all that, we told people to get involved. Some people said, put up the building first, then I give. Why, why do we want you to give after we put up the building? Because they thought it would collapse. They thought the fund would go bust. We would lose all the money. We would not be able to do it because our congregation is small. But we did it. You did it. Come on, amen? You did it. So, see, I want to see first. If I see, it happens. See, see, this is what I keep saying. The natural will always lock you out of the supernatural. If you want to enter into the realm of the supernatural, you've got to take that step of faith. And, and the moment you start doing that, so he says to her, listen, now, I want you to understand something, that God's will is revealed as a twofold will. The first is the, re the revealed will of God, which is the word of God that you have. What I'm sharing with you this morning, come on, that's the revealed will of God, okay? But God also has a secret w will. Let me see. Do we have Deuteronomy there? Do we have Deuteronomy? Let's go to the next scripture. Listen to this one, all right? Deuteronomy. 
There are some things the Lord our God has kept. Come on. Secret. But there are some things He let us know. The things belong, those things which He has let us know, they belong to us and our children forever so that we will do everything in these teachings, which simply means this. Let, let me put the other scripture up. Psalm. Let's go Psalm. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear Him. So God has got some secrets and He's saying, the things that I reveal to you belongs to you and you're supposed to do them. Now, in order to enter into the secret will of God, you've got to walk in the revealed will of God. Because the secret will of God is not told to us. What do you mean uh, uh, by this, Pastor? Well, let me just say this. Jesus is the unfigurable Lord. You cannot figure Him out. You do not know what He's going to do. God is that way. You cannot figure what God is going to do. I'll give you an example. How many of you have seen the movie, The Ten Commandments? All right? You saw Moses acting, did you? <laughs> Charlton Heston, right? Uh, playing Moses. He stands at the Red Sea. And people are beginning to shout and scream because the armies are coming. And he goes, Stand still and you will see the glory of God. Sorry. God. Big win, come on. The whole sea parts. Did he know that there was going to be a parting of the Red Sea? God said, just stand still and you will see the salvation of God. He didn't have a clue what was going to happen. Nobody had a clue. Read through all the miracles and you will understand that nobody knew what was going to happen. Nobody. All right? Did Naaman have a clue when Elijah said to, uh, uh, as Elisha said to him, go dip yourself seven times in the river Jordan? Did he have a clue what was going to happen? All he knew was, the man tells me to go dip myself in the Jordan River. It's a stinking river. We've got great rivers back home. Why must I dip myself in this Jordan River? It doesn't make sense, man. And the servant says to him, well, the man told you to do it. Just go and do it. What can you lose? Go seven times. He goes in. First time comes out. Listen, if there was a miracle in the water, the first time he would have been healed. But the command was seven times. So the man goes in first time, second time, third time, fourth time. Seven times he comes out. And he, did he ever imagine that his leprous skin would become like the skin of a baby? That's what the Bible says. No clue whatsoever. Joshua, take your people every day. For seven days, walk around the wall. Seven times, walk around the wall. Walk around the wall. Just walk around the city of Jericho. Did he ever think that the walls could collapse by them walking? No. None of them. We have run out of wine. Fill those jars with water. Did the guys have a clue that they would draw out wine? You cannot figure out what God is about to do. He is the unfigurable Jesus. Can I hear an Amen. You don't know. That is the secret plan of God. But if you just do the revealed will of God, if you just do what He tells you to do, you will enter into the secret will of God. Come on, amen. How is He going to bless me? I don't know. Pastor, how is God going to bless me? If I do this, how is God going to bless me? Don't ask me, man. I'm not God. I'm a figurable guy. Predictable. But He is not. And when he begins to do something, then you go, wow, man, this is really God. I didn't expect this to happen. Come on, amen. We call it a miracle. I did not expect this to happen. That's why we preach the way we do, because we believe that God can do something powerful. Verse 41. So, they rolled away the stone. It is absolutely vital that you have people standing with you to help you do what you cannot do on your own. They help to remove the heavy stone. Come on, amen. Friday night we had a, a lovely engagement. Sister Michelle uh, Vijay Logue's daughter was engaged to a guy who is from Toronto. So I met the mother, met the boy, and was talking to the mother and told her, I said, you know, some years ago I went to Toronto and I drove from there, wherever we were, about an hour and a half, two hours 
to Niagara Falls. Nice, beautiful honeymoon spot. Right? There was a couple with me. Pastor Lifon was not with me. So I was the lamppost. All alone with just the beat of my heart. Twice I went without her. See how angry? People all around. People all around. But I never heard a sound. Just the lonely beating of my heart. Beautiful place, but nobody to enjoy it with. You need people to celebrate with you. You need people to enjoy life together with you. You need people to cry with you. To go through difficult times together with you. You need people to help you when you are really down. People to help you along and do different things in your place. Come on, amen. You need to be able to call upon people. When, when we began the church, I had to pray, God, give me because I can't do these things. There are many things that I don't know. I absolutely don't know how to run a church. I really don't. So give me the kind of people. We had a worship team, man. The guy would play in the key of D and everybody would sing in the key of F. We had a worship leader who was, forgive, forgive me, sing those Punjabis. We had a sing who couldn't sing. <laughs> Better you remember him. I won't mention his name. All right. He sang off key. Everything was wrong. The musicians played wrong. I mean, the moment the guy would start leading and singing, the, the musician would start taking out his long good morning towel and wipe his head. Because he couldn't play. The guy was singing off key. People would get, I mean, it was so bad. Then I travel over to the States and I see the, orchestra and the music and I sit at the back and cry because we couldn't have that seriously I mean I said God this is not fair man every two miles you drive there's a beautiful church building we are meeting we don't have church buildings they have got fantastic choirs I said what is this do you just like the white man no offense to Pastor Stefan what is this God this is not fair and all the time I'm just complaining and he said just use what you have pray Believe God. And so I pray, help me. Send me the right people. Send me the right people. Give me musicians. Now the musicians are praying, give me another pastor. <laughs> but we need people. We need people to stand with us. Come on, amen. That's why we introduce cell groups. Because the pastor cannot do the job himself. Cell leaders, at least you have a little group where you must belong so that when anything happens, they are there for you. It was nice to do the, uh, do the, the engagement because it was the whole cell group. It was their family. All there, all rejoicing. Come on, amen. Wonderful when we have people like that. Family together. And it's really family. Travel with... Uh, uh, Stephen and Monica over to China, a few of us from our cell, and we went, I mean, it was just family. Wonderful to have people like that. Come on, amen. Huh? And once you build relationships like this, it becomes so easy. See, see, I'm, I'm, I'm a, not a rich man, but I get to travel the world. Why? Because I got family there. I don't spend money on hotels kind of thing, man. I got friends. Wait. Now we've got open invitation. They keep saying, Pastor, please come. I think about five, six times, Pastor, please come to Toronto. Come stay with us. I've got sisters in Canada. I've got friends in uh, Toronto as well. Friends. Wherever we go, we cannot afford hotels and stuff like that. But I don't make friends so that I can stay with them. Lah. <laughs> we make friends because it's wonderful to have friends. So they did something that Martha and Mary could not. In their frustration, they could not do it. They were already bowed down with all this pain and Jesus was the unfigurable one. He weeps with them and so they conclude he's coming to weep because brother has died. He loved him so much. So let's all go together and weep with him. They don't know what he's about to do. And when he says, move the stone, they are just you know, thinking, what are you doing? Do you know the stench that's going to come out? But they do it anyway. They do it anyway. And then it says this. Jesus prays an amazing prayer. And he says, Father, thank you that you have heard my prayer. Notice he doesn't say, Father, I thank you. You are going to hear my prayer. He says, you have heard my prayer. When did he pray this prayer? When they came with the request that Lazarus is about to die. 
and God revealed. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard. The things God has prepared for those who love him. But God revealed them to us by his spirit. So he hears what the father has, is about to do. And he says, thank you, father. So now he comes there. He's just, he just knows what he's about to do. Come on, amen. What does this mean? That before you had your need, we have an intercessor with the father who's already prayed over your need. And he knows how to meet that need. Come on. He's coming to your need, prayed up, prayed for you already. Before you face your need, he was already there. That's what the word provision means. It means before it happens, vision and pro. Before he saw what was going to take place before you came into your need. Come on, amen. Amen. Here's how it ends. They moved the stone. And may God help us this morning to remove the stone of our logic, our natural thinking, our understanding. Proverbs says that we are not supposed to lean upon our own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge Him. Come on, amen? Acknowledge Him. Now here's how it ends. So Jesus begins to cry out. With a loud, booming voice in verse 48, he says, Lazarus, come forth. Why did he say that? Somebody said, because if he said, come forth, all the dead will come forth. But he actually said that in answer to a specific prayer, a specific need. Come on, amen? Unless that specific need is brought to his attention, he can't speak that word. That's why we tell you when you pray, when you come with your need, be specific. Don't just say, God bless me. How, how am I going to, how do you want me to bless you, man? How? Tell me. What is it you really desire? Talk to me about it. We want Lazarus. We love him. The brother whom we love is dead, Lord. Lazarus, he speaks to the situation. Come forth. And it ends like this. He came forth. Next verse. Next one. Do we have the next one? In front of everyone, Lazarus, who had died four days earlier, slowly hobbled out. Still had grave clothes tightly wrapped around his hands and feet, covering his face. He couldn't even take the napkin off his face. Couldn't see very clearly, but just somehow hobbling, shuffling slowly. The word is to shuffle and slowly come out, hands tied, legs tied. And Jesus said to the disciples, Loose him and let him go. See, God gives life to people. You and I must help liberate them. Right? That's how we do it. Cell groups, personal work with one another. We do keep on, on, and on, and on. One at a time, we remove the cloth from their face so they can see things better. We let their hands go. Then we let their feet go. We, he gives life. We bring liberty. Can I hear an Amen. See, and that's, that's the responsibility of the church. It's not good enough just for Christ to give people life. We've now got to come in and bring liberty to them so that they can walk free. And he became in chapter 12, the first couple of verses, he became the biggest threat next to Jesus Christ. Amen. So the Lord doesn't want to just give us life. He wants to give us liberty. Can I hear an amen? Stand with me very quickly this morning. Hallelujah. Verse 45, then many of the people who had come with Mary and seeing the things that Jesus did, believed him. If you will believe, you will see the glory of God. What does the glory of God mean? It means God on display. Very simple. What does the glory of God mean? It means God on display. If you believe, you will see God displaying himself. Can I hear an amen? God on display. As we worship this morning, if you've got different needs, different specific...